Hey, welcome everybody. This is Matt Skinner, MSTV. Today we're on the phone with Cody Pert and Cody. All right, can you hear me right now? Checking in. Yes, yes, I can hear you. All right, awesome. Where are you? Uh, where are you calling in from today? Calling in from Salt Lake City, Utah. Perfect, Cody. Um, you're in our DealMaker 90 Day Challenge program right now, uh, going on, right? That's correct. Yeah. Awesome. How far along are you? Which week are you so far? So we we just completed week five. Awesome. All right, so you're uh, moving along. You're almost halfway through the process, and how do you like it so far? It's awesome. It's going really good. I'm super, uh, super stoked and pumped. I think you did a great program, so it's awesome. Oh, thank you. You know, we used to, I used to teach our 90-day challenge, which is now our 90-day challenge. We call it our DealMaker 90-day challenge, for those of you guys uh, watching this. Um, and I used to teach this in a two-day boot camp, how to buy flip, sell, and finance apartment complexes. And then what I decided to do, and Cody, you know, you could jump in at any time on this. What I decided to do was break it down into a 13 week process. So it's literally like a paint by numbers program where we're going to teach you how to do one part and then you go do it. And then next week you come back, you get taught the next step. So it's like, it's like a Mason laying bricks on top of each other. One brick at a time is how we build our empire. What, uh, is that kind of what the experience has been for you too, man? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's been pretty streamlined, pretty, awesome. pretty awesome. Awesome. Well, you got some questions for me. You uh, emailed in, said, "Hey, Matt, let's, I got some questions for you. I'm, ta I'm excited to be able to be here to answer them uh, for you on MSTV." Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Cool, man. What you got? So uh, when I was talking with Van, he just kind of <clears throat> asked me where I was at in the process and. I've spent a ton of money on other projects and courses and whatnot. Um, I know it takes a lot of action to uh, get to the point where you actually close the deal, but I've always struggled with the money part. So putting the money behind the transaction, like I have the education to analyze deals and put deals together, but then I've never really gone all the way through the whole process because I never had, I was never, I never had the money piece for sure. Like I knew that I could call somebody and be like, Hey, I got this deal. Um, are you going to help me fund it and whatnot? Right. No, I, I totally get it. And let me tell you, Cody, when I started out, I didn't have the money to do deals either. Right. We start, we have to start where we're starting out at. That's why we teach this, um, this process that we call, uh, you know, a lot of people teaching real estate investing, we'll call it wholesaling. Uh, when we graduate into the more of the commercial real estate arena, we, we might call this uh, assigning contracts, which um, is very common in the world of commercial real estate, happens all the time. Whether you're tying up an asset and then assigning it to a brand new LLC or partnership or something like that that you form to, to take down the property, um, or whether you're tying up a property and then maybe, you know, calling one of your associates or friends to take it down. Then you're going to assign the contract to them. And oftentimes we do this for a uh, finder's fee or, or, or perhaps even a marketing fee. So in single family houses, this is kind of the funny thing about single family houses. I've learned this over the, over the years as I've do dove deeper into commercial real estate is the, the quote unquote gurus out there who teach all the tips and tricks and techniques and creative real estate finance uh, things in the single family house business really just came over to the commercial side and learned like the, the normal stuff that happens every day in commercial real estate and then took those high level uh, techniques and brought them to the single family world to do to kind of sell the quote unquote no money down strategies lease options, subject to all inclusive trust deeds, seller carry back, uh, tr you know, closing in a trust, assigning contracts, wholesale. All of these things are commonplace in the multifamily and commercial arenas. And all of these things are stuff that you'll see on a regular basis. Banks see it all the time, lenders see it all the time, uh, you know, closing attorneys or escrow companies, title. Like this is just commonplace in commercial. It's not common in single family, which is why these, you know, quote unquote gurus can make a ton of money teaching high level finance, creative real estate finance and applying it to single family stuff. Cause it's kind of unheard of 
in the, in the arena of homeowners. Um, it's also difficult to implement in the arena of homeowners because if the homeowner doesn't understand what subject two is, they're signing over a deed to your house or something like that, um, it can make them a little bit uneasy. And when people are uneasy, they usually say no, right? So your question is, how do I get started? Like, how do I finance one of these deals? And I'll give you a couple of things to, to, look, at, to look at inside yeah. of that. Well, if, uh, if I found a deal, um, obviously we would underwrite it together because you're not going to take a deal from me unless it's underwritten properly, right? So say I get the deal, we underwrite it, I get it under contract, and then I assign the contract to you. But what happens, so say I don't have $10,000 to put down for a uh, escrow uh, to make the contract go hard. Yep, deposit so, money. How, right. So how would, I, how, would that, how would that work? Great. Um, I'm going to illustrate this on the whiteboard, and um, so our friends watching this from home can check it out. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just kind of outline what this will look like. The first step, if we're going to be doing transactions, in fact, if we're going to be doing any business, we're going to find a need and then fill it. That's what an entrepreneur does. By definition, an entrepreneur's job is to discover, locate, identify a need in the marketplace and then provide a solution to that problem and hopefully get paid a lot of money to do that, to, to solve that problem, right? So that's what an entrepreneur's job is to do. And what we need to do first is find somebody who wants or desires or more, or hopefully needs the product or service that we're about to provide, right? So uh, what, with the exception of Steve Jobs, who was told nobody needs or wants an iPod, he said, fuck you, I'm making an iPod anyway because I want one. And everybody else was like, dude, there's Walkmans or Discman. Like he was told, like just shunned by everybody at the time. Like we, nobody wants that, right? Nobody will do that. And, and, and he invented it anyway. But with, that's the exception. But the, the rule is usually you find a marketplace of, of potential customers and then you provide a solution to their needs. And so having said that, step one is we want to figure out who our buyers are going to be, our buyers list right? Oftentimes our buyers are people that already own apartment buildings. This is the super cool thing about investing in commercial real estate is that people who own commercial real estate usually want to buy more or have some properties to sell, are willing to partner, or all three, right? They're already the same. It's the same game, right? And, and by the way, yeah. I am a commercial real estate owner and I have, I'm in all three categories right this second. I have two properties for sale, right? I got properties I want to buy and I'm open to partnering with you as my student, open to partnering with uh, joint ventures, other operators, guys that have good deals. Like I got some money, I got some credit, I, got, I know what a good deal is. And, and we're hunting for our own deals. So I, I fit into that category. And I'm, a, and I'm just gonna suggest that most commercial investors are gonna, have, are gonna be fit into that same category. One of the cool things about what you're learning inside of this acquisitions process, which by the way, if you guys are, haven't done DealMaker 90, get, in, get plugged in, takes you step by step on how to, literally, how to create a system for attracting motivated sellers. How to build a buyer's list, how to find properties for sale, how to tie them up, how to analyze an apartment complex, and then ultimately how to flip a contract or put together a partnership to buy the asset. So uh, the cool thing about this process is when you find a motivated seller, Cody, when you find somebody who has a divorce going on, a court order to sell, some uh, extenuating circumstance that's causing them to need to sell, not just want to sell, they oftentimes have multiple properties. So it's like hitting a vein, a gold vein, like a miner digging, digging in a cave, and all of a sudden, you, once you hit gold, it's not like you just find one little chunk. Like you, you know, that vein runs for a while. So you're gonna, when you hit a, a, a seller who needs to sell for some reason, they typically have three, four, five, ten properties, and you just go through and systematically buy them all, or trade them all, or flip them all 
or whatever that looks like. And when you hit that vein, you're probably going to, you know, flip a couple contracts, partner with a co on a couple of contracts, and maybe you might even not buy some of them if they're, if they're not that great of deals. But this is what makes commercial real estate so much cooler and so much easier to profit from than single family house business because most of the time people that are in the single family house business and they're in a distressed situation, they usually just have one house, right? So not only are you getting bigger deals with bigger paychecks doing commercial real estate, but you're oftentimes going to be dealing with sellers that have multiple properties and so you're going to be able to do multiple transactions off of one solid lead. And that's really important. So the first thing we want to do is build our buyers list, right? And, and inside of DealMaker 90, we've got um, everybody who owns an apartment complex is probably a willing candidate, right? It's probably somebody who might be interested in buying a property from you. You can go into LinkedIn or Facebook and get involved in specific social media groups to find additional buyers. You can go to apartment owners association meetings to find uh, people that are interested in buying uh, apartment buildings. And, and consequently, all of those things I just mentioned, not only are gonna contribute to building your buyers list, but these are also gonna be people that potentially might wanna sell one of their properties and potentially might wanna partner with you as well, right? So you, you run your marketing, you attract motivated sellers, they call you, they've got a deal, you take it, you analyze it, you underwrite it, and then you are sitting here on, you're like, man, I made an offer, I've got a smoking hot deal, they just accepted my letter of intent, my LOI, and then you go, fuck, I hit a wall, right? I don't have deposit money, right? Is that kind of where we're at right now? Is that kind of what we're, the question becomes? Yeah, exactly, yep. So being a deal maker in my deal maker society and in the deal maker 90, you, can just submit that to, to us through support at dealmakersociety.com. We'll underwrite it with you, analyze it with you, and uh, I'll help you, co you know, coach you through some of the sticking points that you might face. But not everybody watching this has signed up for DM90 yet. So if you haven't gotten De Dealmaker90, you gotta, find, you gotta get it. It's powerful. If you are in commercial real estate, if you wanna have an acquisition system to find properties, get DM90 and it'll, it'll change your whole business career, your whole business outlook. But Cody, so you've got the leg up, man, because you're a deal maker and I'm, an, I'm here to support you one-on-one. -on -one. Let's take, you know, make sure that gets taken care of. But for everybody else out there who hasn't done or signed up for deal maker society yet, you might be asking themselves, all right, what do I do? Right? I found a deal, I found a motivated seller. I underwrote it. It looks like a good deal. I sent a letter of intent, came back. They like my price. They like my terms. They're ready to go. Now, what do I do? The most important thing inside of this game, especially if you're going to be wholesaling, if you're going to be assigning contracts, is building this buyer's list first. Find your customer first, then go find your deals. For, for, for a couple of reasons. Number one, those buyers are going to tell you what they're looking for. They might say, man, I'm not looking, you know, I don't want to buy in that city. I want to buy in this city. Okay, cool. Well, I'm going to go hunt for deals where I can, you know, where I have, where I have a marketable product to sell, right? Um, on, on the other hand, we're going to call this buyer's list up right away the second you get that signed LOI and I'm going to say, hey, Mr. Buyer, check this out. I got a hundred unit deal under contract. It's in South Carolina, just like the city, just, it's the city that you like. I haven't done all the due diligence on this yet, but here's a, here's a deal I'll cut for you. Here's something I've done before, Cody. This is really important. Mr. Buyer, here's the deal. I, I, I need somebody to put up. $20,000 or $40,000 as a refundable, 100% refundable deposit for 30 days while I do my due diligence. Now here's what I'll do, Mr. Mr. Buyer. I'll give you first right of refusal to buy this asset from me if everything looks good. And if I don't buy it, if we don't proceed, right? I'll give you a, and give them a reasonable rate of return on their money for that 30 days, right? If you give somebody, you know, uh, geez, a thousand dollars on that 40 grand, I mean, that's not, you're not getting, that's not a get rich quick scheme, but it sure beats a savings account. You know, if you gave them 
$4,000 on that $40,000, that would be like earning a 12% interest rate on their money for one month, right? So if you gave them 1%, that'd be like earning a 4% interest rate on their money uh, on an annual rate. So not, you know, that's nothing to shake a stick at. Like a lot of people are, and, that, and this is a guarantee, there's no risk because it's refundable. Right? There's their money's not at risk by putting up a deposit for, for you while you do your due diligence. And they get the benefit of having first right of refusal. You, you underwrote the deal, you like it, you show, them the, you show them everything you got, you stay in communication with your buyer, and they're like, damn, I got first right of refusal by putting up the deposit money, and the worst thing that could happen is I'm going to earn a 4% return on my cash with zero risk, that's a that's a that's a good proposition. A lot of guys like I mean we have we have cash you know sitting in a bank account doing nothing in a checking account waiting for our next deal. This is a great way to put it at play. And and frankly for these buyers in the event that a big deal came along and they need to pull out of that escrow, pull out of that deposit on earlier than than what you needed. Hopefully they'll give you 5 days, 10 days to find somebody else to put up the money. You know, they could get out of it if they wanted to. So they're at zero risk zero exposure to the marketplace, helping you out, and at the worst case scenario, earning a reasonable rate of return on otherwise idle cash sitting in the bank. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. So if you offer that to, to one of your buyers, this isn't a hard deal. It's not a difficult place uh, to make that sale. I'll give you one more tip on top of this. Um, if you're out on the marketplace dealing direct with sellers, you'll probably never get asked for proof of funds. And I'm gonna suggest, I don't think I've ever been asked for proof of funds, never one time dealing direct with sellers. And when I've dealt with uh, Marcus and Milchap brokers, right, they only ask for proof of funds if you sound like you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. And I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna make that suggestion. Because nobody else, nobody out there is like trying to flip contracts with no money, right? It's just it's not not a it's not a reality. Everybody started asking for proof of funds on houses because you know the old timers like Ron Legrand went around and taught everybody to make all these offers on houses that were listed, <laughs> and and the people on the buying end didn't have any money to buy them with, and so real estate agents felt jerked you know jerked around. So I don't blame them yeah. for always asking for proof of funds now. It's kind of become standard practice, but it didn't used to be that way. Even you know nine or ten years ago, it wasn't standard. My point in all of this is to say, um, if you're if you act with credibility, by, and we use our scripts and use our the you know questions that we give you to talk to brokers and talk directly to sellers, you'll never sound like you don't know what you're talking about. So you have a leg up in a big way in the, against the competition than anybody else does. If you're not in dealmaker society and you don't have our scripts, you don't have that immediate credit, a uh, credibility building uh, kit, then you're going to need to sound credible and figure that out. And if, and if you're getting shit tested by ask, being asked for proofs of funds for commercial real estate, just know it's because you don't sound credible, right? Now let me tell you how to solve that. So if you screw it up and you don't sound credible and you need a proof of funds because you got a smoking hot deal on your hands, you should be able to go to your buyers and rent a proof of funds from them too. You can go to a buyer, say, hey, Mr. Buyer, I'm looking, I need a million dollar bank statement. I need something to show that we have a million dollar liquid. That can be a line of credit. It can be a, a property in escrow that they're selling, showing that there'll be you know, an estimated closing statement, which we use a lot of times for uh, if we need to go to a bank and prove you know, future liquidity. Um, and it could be just cash sitting in an account like I was talking about. And when I first started out, I had one partner who um, I was at the time, this was many, many, many years ago, I started out in real estate flipping houses, which I don't recommend by the way. It's not, you don't need to start there in real estate. Uh, just jump forward, fast forward to the ultimate investment strategy. Multifamily real estate is the ultimate investment strategy. So what I did back then though, is I went to, I needed a proof of funds because I was buying short sales from the bank. I was buying foreclosed properties from the bank. I need to show off proof of funds, even though I was just flipping most of these. And so I had the little bit of cash that I did have out into the market working for me, plugged into deals. I needed, I needed a bank statement that showed 
you know, six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars liquid. And so what I did was I partnered up with a guy, and every transaction I did, I gave him a thousand bucks. And all he gave me was a bank statement that showed around a million dollars liquid. Right? He he liked the, all he had to do was once a month forward me over his bank statement. He redact, redacted his account number, and I rented his bank statement from him so I could play. And that's it. And that's it. Um, in addition to that, he wrote a letter that accompanied that, and that letter just said, um, I am partners with, I was using an LLC at the time, um, uh, LIG LLC. I'm a partner in this LLC, and we're looking forward to buying, you know, in this case, houses for this account. And that was it. And that worked with banks, it worked with sellers, it worked with real estate agents, and there's no reason why it shouldn't work for anything else. Now, as you demonstrate credibility, and as you begin to embark into this commercial real estate market, you're probably rarely gonna be asked for proofs of funds, but I wanted to give you that extra tip just in case you need it. I don't want this to keep you up at night. Like, I don't want you to be like, oh my God, how am I gonna proof of funds? Because you probably aren't gonna need it, All right? Yeah. Build your buyer's yeah. list, step one, find your customers, then go find deals, and you'll have everything you need lined up. Cool? Nice. Yeah, yep, cool. Any other questions today? Why well, you got me on the phone, Cody. Uh, no, nope, nothing right now. I appreciate, uh, I appreciate you answering those questions for me. That was a big help. Yeah, man, awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing you graduate DealMaker90, and in the meantime, man, make deals and get paid. Make deals and get paid. That's right, that's right. All right, man, we'll catch up to you uh, really soon. Thank you guys for tuning in to MSTV. We've got another episode in the can. <laughs>